Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Robert Johansson. I'm the chairman of the Australia India Institute, and it's my uh, great privilege and honour to welcome you all here tonight. I'd like in particular to welcome uh, His Excellency, uh, the Governor of Victoria, uh, and Mrs Chernoff. The Governor was, as many of you will know, was the Chancellor of this university and is the visitor to this university. Um, he also was the founding uh, chairman of the Australia India Institute and is its patron. So uh, welcome to you, sir, for lots of reasons. Uh, welcome to the High Commissioner um, for India, Mr. Uh, Mr. Biran Nanda, Mrs. Nanda. Um, I'll introduce you a bit more. I think the uh, Consul General of the United States is here. Welcome to you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Raj Kumar, the Acting Consul General in India, of India in Melbourne, uh, and other distinguished guests. Um, I might, in particular, welcome the grandson, great grandson, of Deacon Tom Harley. So, welcome to you, Tom. Um, one of the great uh, pleasures for me in taking this job on was discovering, because um, I had very little con knowledge or contact with, about India before I got this job, is discovering how deep and various are the many links that have existed over the years between Australia and India. Uh, and uh, the person after whom tonight's lecture is, is uh, named, uh, Alfred Deakin, is one such person. Um, he was, as um, many of you will, be, will know, was one of the great founders, one of the great uh, figures in the Federation of Australia. Um, he was born in Collingwood, uh, over in, I think to now, we now call it Fitzroy, in George Street. Um, uh, he became, uh, he was uh, a, a lawyer, he studied at this university, um, became a lawyer, um, according at least to some entries in, in various biographies, wasn't a, great wasn't a great success as a lawyer, but became um, a politician uh, involved in the Victorian, Victorian affairs and then later uh, became one of the great uh, instigators and provokers of Australian Federation. Um, and uh, was in the first ministry uh, on, um, on the retirement of the first Prime Minister, Barton, to go to the High Court, he became the second Prime Minister of Australia and subsequently served a couple of times as Prime Minister. Uh, he was uh, uh, famous for many things. Um, many of the great principles in the foundation of Australia were, of course, reactions against the world, including things like the White Australia policy, uh, of which he was a, um, a great proponent. Um, but he, as I said, had been to India, uh, mostly to investigate irrigation systems. Uh, and he went to other parts of the world, such as to California, where he met the Chaffees, who he brought back to establish uh, irrigation systems in Australia. Um, and when he went to India, uh, he was only there for three months in 1890, but uh, that was sufficient time. He was a quick writer. He produced two books, um, one called Irrigated India and another on Temple and Tombs, uh, most of which were re um, reworkings of things that were published in the Age newspaper, of which, of course, working with uh, the then founder of that, David Syme, um, was one of the other things. So uh, he was a prolific writer and observer. So while, as I say, on the one hand, we have this view of Deacon as being you know, one, of the, uh, one of the thinkers that was behind things like the White Australia policy, he also went to India. And I just, uh, this, is, this is a copy of, that, of one of his books, Irrigated India. Um, and on the one hand, uh, as I say, he produces uh, the, the, the kind of closing of Australia. But on the other hand, it's as though he can't but help himself respond to the, the variety and, and the, uh, 
uh, and the richness that he discovers in India. And uh, I'll just pick out two things that he wrote in this book. Um, he writes, the future relations of India and Australia possess immeasurable potencies. Their geographical proximity cannot but exercise a very real and reciprocal influence upon the forces of national life in each, presenting to both vital problems of common interest and possibilities of political development as vast as they are vague. And then later, racially, socially, politically and industrially, far asunder as the poles, their geographical situation bringing them face to face may yet bring them <coughs> hand to hand and mind to mind. They have much to teach each other. Um, so we don't really need to change much uh, when we think about the relations or the potential of the relations between Australia and India in 2013 from what Deakin was writing in 1890. Our lecturer tonight, uh, we're very honoured to have and welcome the High Commissioner to Australia, um, Mr Biran Nanda, who will deliver this annual Alfred Deakin Memorial Lecture on the subject of Indian foreign policy in a globalised world. Um, uh, the High Commissioner, he completed his postgraduate education at the Delhi School of Economics and joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1978. He served as a diplomat in Singapore, Beijing, Shanghai, Washington DC, Tokyo and Jakarta. So across the great, the great sweep of major missions. He was Consul of General uh, of India in Shanghai in 1996 to 2000, Deputy Chief of Mission in Tokyo from 2000 to 2004, and Ambassador to Indonesia from 2008 to 2012. And between 2004 and 2008, he was head of the Southeast Asia and Pacific Division in the Ministry of External Affairs. Now, I'm told that being that, uh, holding that position meant that you were, meant that the person is responsible for everything from Myanmar to Easter Island. So it's a very broad sweep of tasks. Um, but he has served as, with great distinction um, and uh, he's been a great friend of the Institute in his time in Australia uh, since he's joined the, uh, since he became the High Commissioner in April 2012. Would you please welcome the High Commissioner, Mr Biran Nanda. His Excellency, the Governor of Victoria, Mrs. Chernoff, uh, Mr. Robert Johansson, Professor Amitabh Mattu, Excellencies, dear friends. It's an honor to be invited to deliver the first Alfred Deakin Memorial Lecture. Alfred Deakin, Australia's second Prime Minister, the dominant figure in the first decade of the Federation in Australia, was a gifted politician with a natural talent for compromise and persuasion. He was the embodiment of dual nationalism. Pride in Australia went hand in hand with pride in empire. He was passionate about irrigation and introduced a radical bill in the Victorian Parliament that if it had passed, would have made all natural waters in the colony publicly owned and enabled the construction of irrigation works. In 1890, he traveled to India and Ceylon and published an account of South Asian irrigation. But by, the time his paper uh, but by that time, his paper generated little interest because drought and economic <coughs> depression had struck the eastern colonies. If one were to think of an Indian leader who played a similarly important role in bringing about the Union of India, it would be India's first Home Minister, Sardar Patel. Patel's task was monumental. He had to persuade 565 princely states in British India 
to join the Indian Union even though they had the choice of joining India, Pakistan or remaining independent. This he succeeded in doing between May and August 1947. Though Gandhi did not approve of the partition of India, his values had a deep impact on independent India. India did not part with the UK with feelings of rancor or hatred for the colonial power. Indeed, India chose to remain within the Commonwealth even after she became a republic in 1950. Gandhi's influence was reflected in Nehru's diplomacy and in the adoption of the policy of non-alignment during the Cold War. It manifested itself in contemporary Indian foreign policy through repeated displays of strategic restraint. It is reflected in the diversity of India's strategic partners and the fact that few are concerned about the rise of India. In my talk, I will seek to explain how the interplay between India's domestic situation and changes in the international environment have shaped the contours of India's foreign policy. How India approaches South Asia and the extended neighborhood to the west and the east, India's role in the regional architecture in East Asia and the Indian Ocean region, India's relations with major powers, India's defense and security policy, and finally, India-Australia relations. This I hope to do within the 30 minutes that I have been tasked to finish the task in. <laughs> India has undergone very significant changes in the last decade and a half. During this period, the international order has also seen a profound structural transformation. Consequently, the Indian foreign, foreign policy of India has had to reformulate its priorities. Some of it is reactive to the larger environment, but much of the new thinking is driven by choices we have made due to our changing domestic situation. Let me begin with the changes that have in India that have impelled the emergence of new foreign policy priorities. The economic story is well known. We have achieved an annual rate of GDP growth of over 8% per annum for the last 10 years and hope to push it up even further. Both manufacturing and services have performed impressively. Sectors like information technology have had a larger than life image in this process of change. <coughs> a globally competitive manufacturing industry has emerged in the pharmaceutical, auto component, automotive and engineering sectors. The spread of prosperity has been visible and the population below the poverty line has declined by a quarter between 2005 and 2010. Rising foreign direct investment figures convey both the potential for business and global confidence in our success. India is also making its presence felt economically abroad through trade and acquisitions. While optimistic of our prospects, we have to be objective about the challenges that India faces. We ourselves believe that our performance has fallen short in a number of areas. In the social sector, we have not addressed primary education and primary health as well as and as effectively as the nations of Southeast Asia and East Asia. This leaves us vulnerable to shortage of skills at various levels. It also creates challenges of employability and social backwardness. The foremost priority of the Indian government is therefore to set up social sector investments. We need both higher growth and more inclusive growth. Bottlenecks posed by the current state of infrastructure are a major concern. The impact on our efficiencies, employment potential and growth our successes in these sectors are central to the management of change. Driven so significantly by domestic consumption, India has had to create her own model of growth. There is, moreover, no precedent for such a scale of change taking place within a democratic framework. An era of rapid GDP growth rates and closer integration with the global economy called for a different approach. Emphasis on expanding foreign trade and attracting greater foreign investment flows required a refocusing of our energies. Indeed, the inter se importance of relationships itself changed, taking these priorities into account. We had to take note, for example, of the shift in economic weight towards the Asia-Pacific region. Energy cooperation acquired a greater salience in our thinking. Other key sectors like agriculture, education, skills, and science and technology also benefited from greater international cooperation. The change of mindsets that was perceptible in India was also reflected in our diplomacy. We look to leveraging the external environment to achieve faster growth. 
Our growing strengths now allowed us to address what risks there may be in greater engagement. At the same time, we sought to avoid the temptations of a mercantilist approach. Our efforts would be better rewarded if they were perceived to be equitable rather than self-serving. Therefore, even as we drew from the world what was to our advantage, India remained ready to contribute what it could. We are today a net aid donor with programs extending to a number of developing countries. Focusing on our skills and development strengths, we offer an ambitious and broad spectrum training program, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program to 156 countries. In peacekeeping, our forces have participated in 43 of the 61 missions undertaken since the founding of the UN. A need-based review of our priorities did not present the full picture in its complexity. Global structural changes also had to be taken into account. Not only had the Cold War ended, but an extraordinary interdependence amongst leading states of the international order was in the making. The intensity and interpenetration of global processes is of an altogether different order today. They affect fundamental choices. Three factors stood in the way of these processes until a few years ago. First, the Cold War and its ensuing political polarization was a great divide. Second, the weakness of post-colonial economies prevented them from playing an adequate role. Third, the disruption of natural connectivities and the artificial comp compartmentalization of regions during the colonial era also built barriers. India, for example, was separated from Southeast Asia, West Asia, and Central Asia, all regions with which it had deep historical connections. What an eminent historian described as the natural unity of the Indian Ocean was disrupted and is yet to be fully restored. At the moment of our independence, Jawaharlal Nehru very presciently recognized the inherent interdependence of our world when he declared that peace has been said to be indivisible, so is freedom, so is prosperity now, and so also, so also is disaster in this one world that can no longer be split into isolated fragments. Today, there's border appreciation that what unites key players is more than what divides them. Policymakers are beginning to understand that interdependence and competition can coexist. This has profound consequences for foreign policy formulation. We see relationships less in terms of zero-sum games. Progress in one relationship can lead to significant improvements in others. We are willing to engage more because there are thresholds below which relationships cannot afford to fall. This allows broader engagement and isolation of differences where they exist. The confidence can, to moderate problems can grow if the natural tendency is to search for commonalities. All of this naturally requires a change of mindsets. The old balance of power approach must give way to a greater acceptance of multipolarity not only globally, but in Asia as well. Any assessment of the future directions of the international system naturally has to take into account the short-term challenges the system has to encounter. There are broadly four categories of issues that a more interdependent world will have to address. Each one has its own implications for India's foreign policy. First, there is the growing salience of the role of non-state actors in global politics. These are predominantly drawn from forces that are opposed to the current international order and the values it represents. Since the order itself is essentially pluralistic and diverse, non-state actors tend to be driven by narrow ideologies and a fundamentalist outlook. Al-Qaeda is seen as the archetypical after 2001, but Indians know that they have been meeting such threats for a decade before that. The solution to this challenge lies in resisting the temptation to make it equally narrowly. Instead, we must remain steadfast in our commitment to multiculturalism. Non-state actors can move independently or in tandem with less responsible states of the international system. Such states, therefore, represent a challenge by themselves. They see themselves as prone to be swayed by intolerance and narrowness of thought and are out of step with the contemporary world. Their relationship with the world tends to be adversarial in character and carries a sense of self-interest to the extreme. 
Therefore, there is little hesitation in defining the rules by which nations of today interact with each other. A strategy to deal with such states is to draw them into the system while simultaneously deterring them from undertaking irresponsible actions. Diplomacy of such complexity obviously poses its challenges. We are also required to address a growing host of global challenges ranging from natural disasters and pandemics to environmental concerns and terrorism. They need coordinated responses from the international community for two reasons. One, the magnitude of the problem and its spread across many nations makes it difficult for any single nation to respond. Second, the very lack of national ownership over the problem limits a purely national solution. As the 2004 tsunami experience demonstrated, building habits of cooperation among nations is vital to a speedy response to global challenges. This is an important objective for contemporary Indian foreign policy. The fourth category of challenges comes from the inequities of the globalization process. If there is a continuing mismatch between expectations and benefits, we are writing a prescription for greater global uncertainty. The loss of cultural identities in the process of modernization is an equally worrying phenomenon. Given our stakes in global stability, the Indian policymaker today has to apply the range of options available from training and assistance to soft power and sharing of intercultural experiences to achieve the best possible outcome. There has to be closer integration between foreign policy and defense strategy. Our thinking itself must be less structured and more flexible. Utilization of civil society mechanisms will have to grow, including track to dialogues. Foreign offices have to co-opt other players in order to enhance their own influence. The prospects in our own immediate neighborhood also call for more imaginative initiatives. We are committed to ensuring a peaceful periphery. This is a requirement not only for India's continued growth, but for the larger good of global society as well. Whether it is trade or logistics, energy or services, a partnership with India can be of great value to our neighbors. Our challenge is to provide them the incentives to step forward. Today, transnational cooperation is essential if communications within South Asia and beyond are to significantly improve. The interdependent nature of security is increasingly evident. India is not just a motor for regional economic growth. It can equally be the bulwark of regional security. In charting a bolder course, we will inevitably come up against suspicions and skepticism. To allay them, we will have to be prepared to go the extra mile. Enlightened self-interest must become the yardstick of our foreign policy initiatives. The changes that I have spoken about are at multiple levels and taking place simultaneously. Their impact is already visible in our initiative with the neighbor, our neighbors, with the extended region, and with major global partners. In South Asia, we have stepped up our bilateral engagements while seeking to make SARC a broader and more open organization. At its 14th summit meeting in New Delhi in April 2007, we welcomed Afghanistan as a member, and China, Japan, US, the EU, and South Korea as associated observers. In 2008, Australia became an observer in SARC. Our decision to unilaterally liberalize tariffs for least developed countries of the region and to establish the South Asian free trade area underlines the seriousness of our commitment to a South Asian customs union and eventually to an economic union. Our vision, our vision of a stronger regional cooperation and harmony has led us to boldly address even difficult historical problems with a view to finding long-term solutions. Geopolitically, India reaches well beyond South Asia, which is essentially a geographical concept. We share one of the longest land borders in the world with a non-South Asian country, China. Central Asia is a part of our immediate neighborhood. We share land and maritime borders with three Southeast Asian countries, Myanmar, Indonesia, and Thailand. We have a land border of some 1,600 kilometers with the ASEAN through Myanmar. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands of India are just over 100 kilometers from Indonesia. Our exclusive economic zone spans waters from the Persian Gulf to the Straits of Malacca. India straddles vital sea lanes and oil routes between the Gulf and Japan. With regions immediately east and west of India, 
our endeavor is to revive historical cultural linkages and add more dimensions to our contemporary cooperation. In our extended neighborhood to our west, we enjoy traditional close political, economic, and cultural linkages with countries of the Gulf region. These countries are amongst our largest trading partners. Today, India is a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum, a summit partner with the ASEAN, a member of the East Asia Summit and the Asia-Europe meeting. Our Look East policy is being strengthened by the regional economic integration through special trade and investment arrangements such as the India-ASEAN Free Trade Area, the India-Singapore Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, the India-Thailand FTA, the India-Malaysian FTA, and many cooperative projects that we are pursuing as part of our dialogue partnership with the ASEAN. We have an open mind with regard to cooperative efforts and are willing to examine the merits of participation if they are in consequence, if they are in consonance with our objectives and values. We are aware that the challenges that are preoccupying the international community can adversely impact the process of Asian reintegration. The global economic crisis has thrown us challenges of constricting export markets and slowing inward foreign investment flows. The process of Asian integration has, however, gathered momentum and has enabled our economies to sustain their growth rates at a time when economic problems are present in Europe and North America. The Indian Ocean region is crucial to India's geopolitical interests and to its economic and energy security. The region's salience will only increase in the coming years as the weight of global activity shifts towards Asia. India assumed the chairmanship of the Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, which brought together 19 littoral states of the Indian Ocean Rim. We had placed emphasis on the need to building functional relationships between the navies and coast guards of the region to enhance cooperation and security. We have also called upon member states to address issues of transport infrastructure and connectivity, which hamper growth of intra-regional trade and investment. At the Bengaluru meeting of the IORARC, the meeting identified six priority areas, including maritime security, disaster management, trade and investment facilitation, fisheries, academic and STS science and technology cooperation, tourism, and cultural exchanges. In our view, the roadmap for the IOR ARC should be inclusive, comprehensive, bringing together governments, civil society, business, and reflecting relevant common regional interests. We have called on a special emphasis for job creation, capacity building, and skilling of youth, sustained efforts to promote developmental energy and food security needs, and connectivity to facilitate greater trade and investment. We are conscious that cooperation between states acts as a force multiplier in a ch ch fast changing world. With this in mind, India has participated in the creation of transcontinental region regional groups like the BRICS and the India, Brazil, South Africa, or IPSA, in which we can achieve our objectives in sustainable development. I would now like to briefly touch upon India's defense and security perspectives and our defense policy. India is strategically located vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf, Central Asia, the Indian Ocean region, and East Asia. Our land frontiers extend more than 15,500 kilometers. We share borders with seven countries. These borders are geographically and topographically diverse, posing unique challenges for our defense and security. The delineation and demarcation of some sections of our land borders have to be resolved, and this is a factor in our security calculus. India's maritime boundaries overlook three major shipping lanes. Our EEZ stretches from the Persian Gulf to the Straits of Malacca. India has two long coastlines to defend and its island territories to the west, the Lakadev and Minigoy Islands, and the Andaman Islands to the east are at a distance of 450 and 1300 kilometers from the mainland respectively. In terms of trade, India is an island nation. The overwhelming majority of our imports and exports, including crucial energy and commodity supplies, are carried by the sea route. In the post-Cold War period, the security environment has become more complex, with asymmetric threats from terrorism and piracy. The spread of small arms and light weapons, the proliferation of WMD, and the globalization of the Indian economy have linked India's security directly with that of the extended neighborhood. 
Our defense force structure is therefore predominantly based on the requirement of defending an extensive and geographically diverse territory from external threats in a self-reliant manner. In relation to the challenges of our security and our neighborhood, India has a modest level of defense spending, 1.9% of GDP in the last financial year. This is much lower than the levels of defense spending in our immediate neighborhood. Our relations with major powers have undergone a remarkable transformation over the last decade. Indeed, there is no other emerging economy apart from India that has, since the end of the Cold War, established strategic ties, including in the areas of defense and dual-use technologies, with such a diversity of partners, some of whom do not, who do not have similar strategic ties with each other. With the United States, the agreement on civil nuclear cooperation and a new framework on defense cooperation are two examples of the transformation underway. India-US relations have become increasingly broad-based, covering cooperation in areas such as trade, economy, defense, security, education, science and technology, civil nuclear energy, space technology, clean energy, environment and health. People-to-people -people interaction provides further vitality and strength to our relationship with the United States. The total merchandise trade between India and the US was 57.8 billion in 2011. The two-way services trade was approximately US dollars 50 billion, making the United States India's largest trading partner in goods and services. Over 100,000 Indian students currently pursue their higher education in US universities. With China, a more broad-based relationship with greater exchanges allowed us to build bridges with a degree that could not have been anticipated a decade ago. China is an immediate neighbor and a priority for our foreign policy. We have attempted to establish a strategic and cooperative partnership with China. A stronger India-China economic relationship can make a direct contribution to the quality of life of over 2 billion people. China has emerged as the largest trading partner of India and our engagement with China is now multifaceted. Naturally, as between any two large countries, there are areas of convergence as well as fields of divergence. We will continue to engage China in a constructive and forward-looking manner so that both countries can achieve a win-win situation. With Russia, a long-standing friend and reliable partner, our mutually beneficial interaction, particularly in energy and technology trade, has received a greater boost. Bilateral ties with Russia are a key pillar of India's foreign policy. India sees Russia as a time-tested friend that has played a significant role in its economic development and security. Since the signing of the Declaration on the India-Russia Strategic Partnership in October 2000, India-Russia ties have acquired a qualitatively new character in almost all areas of the bilateral relationship. Several institutionalized mechanisms have been put in place to ensure regular interaction and follow-up of cooperation activities. Russia has become also been a long-standing partner in the area of nuclear energy. India and Russia have been collaborating in several high-technology space projects, including Chandrayaan-2 and the Russian GLONASS satellite navigation system. With Japan, the convergence of our interests has encouraged us to find new areas of cooperation. India and Japan share a global vision of peace, stability, and shared prosperity based on sustainable development. Shared democratic values and a commitment to human rights, pluralism, open society, and the rule of law underpin the global partnership between the two countries. In recent years, the two countries have strengthened their cooperation in diverse areas, including economy, environment, energy, disarmament, non-proliferation, security, and building on their strategic convergence. We are negotiating a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with Japan. As I speak about the changing nature of our engagement with the international community, it is but natural I should refer to the relations between Australia and India. India and Australia have several commonalities, including the shared values of a democratic system, a free press, an independent judiciary, and a vibrant civil society. These elements have served as a solid foundation for close cooperation and multifaceted interaction between the two countries. Today, it is on the basis of our shared interests that India and Australia are witnessing a robust development in our bilateral ties. 
we have established institutional platforms for furthering cooperation in diverse areas like foreign affairs, defense, education, science and technology, and resources. High-level visits on both sides are promoting engagement across a wide range of areas and creating new opportunities for both countries. Prime Minister Julia Gillard's state visit to India in October last year was an outstanding success with substantive outcomes that have contributed significantly to the agenda of our strategic partnership. We have shared perspectives on global challenges like international terrorism and our partners in regional cooperation in the context of our dialogue partnership of the ASEAN and membership of the East Asia Summit. As our bilateral ties expand, <coughs> we have a growing interest in the maintenance of security of sea lanes of communication in our region. As the center of gravity of the world economy shifts to Asia and the Indian Ocean region, India and Australia have the potential to cooperate more closely in areas like combating piracy, disaster management, food and energy security, and the prevention of drug trafficking. We welcome the White Paper on Australia in the Asian Century and its emphasis on building relationships with Asian countries, including India. There has been a significant expansion of trade and investment ties between our two countries. The comprehensive economic and cooperation agreement negotiations that we have embarked upon will strengthen our institutional connectivity and accelerate the rapid expansion of our commercial ties. We expect that the conclusion of the agreement will expand the base of merchandise trade, remove non-tariff barriers, facilitate investment, and address behind the border restrictions to trade. We seek to achieve some correction in the adverse balance of trade in goods and services with Australia. In services, we seek greater mode for access and mutual recognition agreements. As the Indian economy grows, the global situation presents a mixed picture. On one hand, we are growing at a healthy pace, increasing our share in global trade and output. On the other hand, many obstacles have to be overcome if we are to sustain rapid growth in the years ahead. Particularly important are the supply side constraints of India's narrative of catch-up growth, including energy, water, food, infrastructure, and not in the least, education and skills training. It is no surprise, therefore, that these supply side constraints are the driving force behind the rapid growth in ties between India and Australia. <clears throat> there is much that India can gain from interaction and exchanges with Australia in terms of best practices, improved capabilities, and the additionality of resources. Australia is a major <clears throat> and growing source for imports of resources, gold, copper, coal, and diamonds for the Indian economy. A number of Indian companies have invested in the resources and manufacturing sectors in Australia. We have welcomed the decision of the Australian government to allow exports of uranium to India. Nuclear power generation is an important element in our efforts to reduce the carbon footprint of the economy. Australian companies possess expertise, technology, and products in a number of areas of interest to us. They are increasingly looking to opportunities in telecom, logistics, steel production technologies, mining technologies, energy exploration, and infrastructure projects. Australian investments in India are making significant contributions to the economic relationship between the two countries. Australia is one of the major destinations for Indian students studying abroad. At present, there are 36,000 Indian students studying in Australia's tertiary and vocational education sector. Based on a 2012 survey of universities in Australia, it was revealed that 179 formal agreements have been concluded between Australian and Indian universities as of May 2012. Of these, 172 are currently active. They involve student and staff exchanges as well as research collaboration. Five Australian universities deliver 15 programs in India. As the private sector increases its participation in the tertiary education sector in India, and the regulatory environment evolves, opportunities for foreign participation in tertiary education in India will also increase over time. We are witnessing the emergence of a new opportunity for Australian vocational training institutes to deliver services in India. Like other emerging Asian economies, India faces a huge requirement of vocational education training over the next few decades. 12 million people enter the workforce in India every year. Indian corporates have successfully tied up with, with Australian vocational training institutes to train trainers in specific skills in India. Skills training and vocational education, therefore, represents a huge opportunity for Australia to leverage and benefit from Indian growth in the coming decades. It is also a win-win opportunity for India as we seek to overcome capacity constraints in this area. 
In science and technology, we have been cooperating in a number of focal, focus areas, including tsunami warning, clean energy, and joint research projects. The Australia-India Strategic Research Fund is an ex outstanding example of how we have collaborated in scientific research and how our institutions have successfully developed networks in either country. The AISF supports science and technology collaboration in areas of agricultural research, astronomy and astrophysics, environmental sciences, microelectronics, nanotechnology, renewable energy, marine sciences, and earth system sciences. Many of these projects touch the daily lives of people in India. We need to strengthen such collaboration in the future. Our two countries are also establishing new institutional platforms which will widen the scope of science and technology cooperation in the future. For example, there is a water technology partnership where we can benefit from Australian experience in river basin modeling. We have recently concluded an MOU on cooperation in space sciences, which will open an important new area in our collaborative endeavors. Growing people-to-people -people links are an indispensable aspect of globalization and regional integration in the Asian region. How can we encourage the expansion of tourism between Australia and India? Better communication links, including direct flights, is certainly part of the answer. Sporting and cultural events can stimulate tourist traffic. India and Australia will have to focus on marketing each other in a more effective manner. Australia and India have a unique opportunity to be partners in progress in the Asian century, provide they equip themselves with the awareness, knowledge, and tools that would enable them to do so. It is possible to identify several areas of convergence between India and Australia in terms of our strategic interests. Let me list some areas where we can work together. First of all, Australia in its search for new avenues of enhancing economic growth should look more closely at the complementarities and opportunities of offered by India with its huge market. Economic cooperation must continue to provide a strong underpinning to our bilateral relationship. Second, there is an impressive array of bilateral, regional, and global issues that we have agreed at the highest level to address as part of our strategic partnership for the 21st century. For instance, we have common interests in maintaining the security of sea lanes and in combating terrorism. Third, we have common approaches and concerns on a range of regional issues which can be explored further. Fourth, we can work together to restore the credibility and authority of the UN and promote UN reforms, making its institutions more representative of current realities. Fifth, we can work together within the G20 towards strengthening the global financial system. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, High Commissioner, for that very comprehensive overview of Indian foreign policy in a globalizing world and a really powerful survey of the manner in which India's foreign policy has moved to where we are today. I have the pleasure of now inviting questions from the audience for the next 10 minutes or so. Mr. Bhatia, and I've introduced you, uh, Ravi, but you could probably introduce yourself fully. On. It is on, right. Anyway, try to speak louder, if, if, even if it's not on. Uh, Excellency, thank you for a very comprehensive uh, expose of uh, the Indian foreign policy on a, on a global basis. The, my question relates to India's immediate neighborhood, and that is that how does a country which is seen as a soft power deal with an extremist theocracy who with wages war in a low intensity manner. I think I uh, addressed uh, this issue indirectly during the course of my speech. Uh, we have to adopt a twin prong approach to deter uh, uh, aggressive actions while at the same time drawing uh, countries uh, within the international system. So, uh, and as, as, as I also mentioned during my talk, uh, I think uh, our own response has always been uh, towards uh, talking and dialogue. And uh, we have always uh, 
adopted a policy of strategic restraint. <coughs> because we do not believe that uh, exacerbating violence uh, is uh, the answer to this question. The gentleman there. Ryan Rosario, I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Can I just ask you about this, the student um, cooperation efforts and student exchanges? How would India be addressing the risk of, uh, for want of a better word, the brain drain or the departure of the, the best and brightest to, to countries of the developed world where uh, you know, India is sacrificing some of those minds? Not sacrificing, but they aren't returning to India to perhaps um, uh, you know, offer the best of their knowledge to Indian society so that people can be uh, can rise up from poverty. Well, um, yes, I think you correctly pointed out that uh, and now there is a two-way flow. Uh, there are many uh, people of Indian origin who are also returning to India to do business. And Indian communities in uh, foreign countries have also contributed to uh, building business links between India and those countries. Uh, this uh, probably one example is the very uh, high number of Indian entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley in uh, uh, the United States. Uh, the presence of Indians in uh, the IT industry of the US may have been one reason why 60% of our IT exports is to Europe and the US. So uh, definitely, uh, uh, this is no longer viewed purely as a brain drain, uh, but uh, as also uh, something that contributes to uh, business links uh, in a globalized world. Yes, the gentleman here. Uh, Ms. Nanda, uh, I'm a student of uh, international development. I just recently arrived, fresh off, fresh off board. And uh, the question I had is that uh, you seem to have laid out a lot of uh, positives in the future relation between Australia and India. But what, in your view, are going to be the significant challenges that this relationship would pose? Or are there any? And how do you see that we overcome them uh, between Australia and India? Well, I think the biggest challenge is uh, uh, exploiting the potential opportunities. So that really is left to us because uh, I don't see any, uh, any, uh, any negatives in the relationship, but only positives in terms of the potential. Uh, as I said, the, uh, uh, this, at the moment, the relationship between the two countries is being driven by the supply side constraints of the Indian economy. So we are short of resources, we are short of energy, we are short of skills, we are short of uh, uh, education. We need to cooperate in science and technology and business innovation. That's what's driving India-Australia relations. But there is uh, a lot that uh, these relations can grow in a very big way uh, in other areas. For example, uh, uh, I believe that 80% of Australia's economy is services, and more than 50% of the Indian economy is services. But our services trade is very small. So if we can address some of the barriers to services trade, uh, within this comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, we, our uh, economic and commercial interaction can grow manifold. There are also a lot of uh, there are a lot of areas where you have a competitive advantage, where you have very good technology, you have very good scientific research, uh, and areas which are uh, we are looking to expand in our economy. One example is solar technology. We have a target of producing two gigawatts of solar power by 2020, and I'm aware that many Australian companies have, uh, universities have very good technology in this area. And I'm aware that many of them are already in touch with Indian entrepreneurs in this area. So these are, these are the kind of uh, potentialities that there are for uh, two-way connections in, uh, in business innovation and uh, uh, commercial interaction which have to be exploited. And that is the biggest challenge, because I don't think there is uh, enough information uh, about the opportunities available in either country. Uh, three final questions. A gentleman here, Mike, and a gentleman here. I'm afraid I'll have to bring it to a close after that. Yes, please. Uh, Zafar from uh, Sinclair Nightmares. It's one of the engineering companies in Australia. Uh, we've been trying to work out um, um, opportunities in India. As a private sector, our experience is um, always the government um, 
to government transaction is welcome, government to academic yeah. transaction is welcome. Yeah. And how does uh, private sector play in this area? In the area of? Uh, in, in, with the Indian government opportunities, especially we are, we are working on the water technology with CSIRO as a private sector, but how do private companies approach the Indian government? When we approach, we always look at more, it's a government to government transaction, like a bilateral relation, it works out, but for private companies such as us, how do we work with the Indian government directly? Well, I must say that the government market is always difficult to enter in any country. And, uh, but I would say that if you are in the water technology business, this is a huge growth area in India. Uh, water, uh, water systems are being, uh, distribution systems are being handed over to private companies. There are many cities in India where, uh, uh, what, uh, which are introducing uh, new investments in uh, uh, the distribution of water supply in uh, water purification, water recycling. And uh, this is potentially, and already is a very big business area. But uh, this is not something that you, uh, developing such a business is not something you can just fly and develop. You have to be present over a period of time because you have to talk to a, 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 a range of stakeholders. You have to talk to state governments, you have to talk to municipal authorities, you have to talk to business partners in India. So it's, uh, it is not something that you can have instant gratification. Particularly, I would say that this is almost universally true in all countries, including Australia, that breaking into the government market is much more difficult than doing business with a private company. I should just give a feedback. Austria has done an excellent work uh, in getting companies uh, in front of the ground. Okay. So, yeah. That's a good take to get someone who's formerly with Austria. Yeah. Hi, Commissioners. Thank you very much. Um, Mike Moynard, I'm, I was with Austrade, but I'm now with the Australian India Institute. My question relates to ASEAN and your focus of being uh, in Jakarta for the last four years. I wonder if you could comment on um, the relationship perhaps between India and Australia and ASEAN and going into the future, perhaps how um, uh, those three areas can work more closely together, both in cooperation, in, in national development, but also um, in uh, trade and commerce and investment. Well, uh, uh, in the ASEAN, uh, with the ASEAN, uh, there are two institutional frameworks where uh, we are working in parallel or together. One is the East Asia Summit, uh, and the other is uh, the, uh, our dial respective dialogue partnerships with the ASEAN. And uh, like most other dialogue partners, uh, India and Australia have got uh, programs with ASEAN countries. Uh, with ASEAN countries as a whole, we have focused a lot of our attention in human resource development. So we have set up entrepreneurship development centers, English language training centers, IT training centers. Uh, and we have now also uh, uh, in the process of implementing a program to uh, give real-time imagery from our OceanSat and ResourceSat satellites to ASEAN countries for uh, mapping resources on ground and various other applications and in the oceans. Uh, so uh, our, uh, we are also cooperating in areas like science and technology. So we have a very diverse and large program of cooperation with ASEAN countries uh, uh, under our dialogue partnership and so does Australia. Uh, but within the East Asia Summit, I think uh, cooperation is focused on two or three areas. One is that we are working on malaria prevention. There's, that's a project that we are working on. Second thing, we have been talking about the need to uh, create an institutional framework of uh, East Asia Summit uh, finance ministers uh, to uh, regionally discuss some of the issues and try to get a regional consensus on some of the issues that get thrown up into the G20 meetings. So uh, uh, we are also now in the process of uh, uh, discussing with the ASEAN countries within East Asia Summit, the RCEP, which is the Reg Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, which will uh, try to create a seam seamless uh, uh, economic community or uh, seamless free trade area uh, within the East footprint of the East Asia Summit and perhaps include some other uh, partner countries also. So this is a very major area of cooperation because at the moment regional economic integration between ASEAN and its EAS partners 
uh, is somewhat uh, broken because it's in the form of uh, Australia ASEAN FTA, India ASEAN FTA. The intention is to create a seamless area of uh, an FTA that covers all these countries. So that would be the next step. And that process has just begun. One final question. Sorry, I miss everything. Yeah, please go ahead. My name is Chokralingam. I'm living here for the last 30 years. And I don't have a question. I just want to add some more information about. But you uh, have to keep the information really short. No, 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 it will be useful. I will make it very quick. Yeah. There was one the uh, the Theosophical Society, which was started in America, in New York. They came to Madras, and they spread all over. And Alfred Deakin was the secretary for Melbourne okay. in Theosophical Society for some time before he entered into the politics. So there was some uh, Theosophical or spiritual connection between uh, Alfred Deakin and India. That is Thank useful you. information. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have now the great pleasure of thanking, first of all, the governor of Victoria, the patron of the Australia India Institute, the Honorable Alex Chernoff and Mrs. Chernoff, for their presence and for their continued patronage of the Australia India Institute. Thank you, governor. Thank you, Mrs. Chernoff. I have a great joy and uh, delight in thanking you, sir, the High Commissioner of India, His Excellency Birin Nanda, for that fantastic lecture and for all the support that you've given us and Mrs. Nanda for her presence. The acting Council General, Mr. Raj Kumar, all other staff members, Mr. Rakesh and <coughs> others from the Council General of India. Uh, the uh, Council General of the United States, uh, is the Council General of the US here? Uh, oh, you are here. Thank you, ma'am, for your presence here uh, and for your support of the Institute. And thank you, Robert Johansson, the chair of the Australia India Institute, our great staff, Elise Hogone, Simon, uh, Chris Kremer, uh, Suresh, and everyone else from the Institute who's here and, who can, or, and all of them who continue to work tirelessly to build the Institute and to help us scale new heights. And thank you very much, all of you, for your presence here. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.